would like to invite you, uh, and also youth and children, into a conversation about a crazy idea. Or at least I, I thought it was crazy when I first heard it. Children should be given the vote. Now, my first response to that was as a parent of three girls. Um, and any mother who's fumbled in her purse in the grocery store checkout line doesn't need, thank you very much, to be plunged into a deep debate with the three-year-old who's been eyeing the chocolate bars set strategically at toddler eye level. <laughs> Can you just imagine these kids on election day lined up at the polling station, standing quietly in line with their purple crayons in hand, ready to mark an X beside the name that will best represent their interests. Societies have always drawn a very clear line between those who are capable and those who are not, between those who are informed and those who are not, between those who are responsible and those who are not. And children are not capable, they're not informed, and they're not fully responsible. It is the capable, informed citizen that has the privileges of citizenship and to exercise its most fundamental right, okay, to vote. Democracies have known that for a long, long time. In 1906, a, um, a certain Mr. Samuel Evans, QC, stood up from his seat as a member of parliament in the British House of Commons. And in response to a proposal by the Labour Party, took, I imagine, a step forward and said, if women were to be entitled to the privileges of citizenship, they ought to perform its duties. Would it be desirable, I say, would it be desirable that women ought to go out to battle? Now, I can imagine Mr. Evans having raised his voice because the newspapers the day reported that his words were met with howls of outrage by the women packed in the public gallery of the House of Commons that day in late April, 1906. And in Mr. Evans' view, women were not capable, they were not informed, and they were not responsible. And over years and over decades, the women's movement gathered a great momentum by repu repeatedly refuting that idea showing that women were as capable, as informed, as responsible as any man. But the women's movement, on its way to winning the vote, did something more than that. It questioned the fundamental logic of this conventional women, uh, wisdom, that citizenship was a privilege, a privilege that had to be earned. They argued that citizenship was a right inherent into the, uh, to the individual, a right that created a reciprocal duty, a duty to be recognized. Women did not have to prove that they were worth it. Okay. Now, think of another line that we draw, the age of majority between those who are too young to vote and all, all the others. Okay. All democracies draw a line like that. But nowhere do we draw a line at the other end of the age spectrum. Nowhere do we say to the elderly, you are too old to vote. My grandmother, uh, let's face it, suffered some very serious physical and cognitive limitations in the last period of her life. I mean, my 12-year-old at the time was clearly much more capable, much more informed, 
much more responsible. But if the idea that we should take the vote away from everyone over the age of 85 somehow rubs you the wrong way, it's because you too have this notion of citizenship as a right. And the howls that met Mr. Evans that day could also be interpreted as demands, demands that those who govern us should recognize that right. Now, from this perspective, the idea that children should have the vote, it doesn't sound that uh, crazy. Okay. To be sure, children are adults in becoming. All right? But still, they have their own concerns and their own interests about how home should be constructed and about the home that they should inherit in the future. All right? But just how to make that happen is a puzzling and challenging question. And I want to suggest that to continue this conversation forward uh, in a constructive way, that we could rely on some of the articles in the Convention of the Rights of the Child. And I want to draw your attention to two articles in particular. Article 12 says that governments have a, a duty and a responsibility to put mechanisms, policies, institutions uh, into place that give children a chance to express their voice. Mm -hmm. Now, age and maturity certainly come into this. Right? And it's quite reasonable to set an age of majority, be it 21, be it 18, or as even as some are arguing now, uh, 16 years of age. But the fact that citizens younger than that age of majority don't have the vote isn't saying that they don't have the right. It's just saying that our duty towards them is somehow imperfectly being performed. All right? We need to take some extra steps. We take those extra steps for the elderly. In my country, uh, Canada, polling booths are mobile. On election day, polling booths go to old age homes in recognition of the fact that some people there suffer physical limitations that impair their mobility. In the United Kingdom, if you, fall, uh, if you have a health impairment, you can assign your vote to somebody else. With your permission, someone will vote for you by proxy. So we might think about how we can take these extra steps for children. And the second article that I want to draw your attention to from the convention, Article uh, 5, says quite clearly that parents have both the responsibility and the, the, the duty to direct and guide the exercising of a child's rights. Parents should certainly do this, being conscious of the evolving capacities of the child. So, for example, uh, one of the things we do is we give parents money. The rich democracies transfer substantial monies to parents to lower the risks that children will grow up in poverty. All right? Parents have a responsibility to spend that money in the best interests of the child. So the proposal that's been floating around in this conversation that democracies are having is that just as we transfer monetary resources to parents for the benefit of children, so too should we transfer political resources. The proposal we'd like to entertain is that parents should get an extra vote for every child under their guardianship. So how would this work? In my household, there are five citizens. My wife and I, and our three daughters, a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 15-year-old. If an election were held tomorrow, 
these five citizens would get four votes. The idea is that my wife and I would be given an extra vote. Perhaps my wife would cast it in the name of my youngest child. Perhaps I would cast it. Or perhaps we're each given a half a vote. Or perhaps even my youngest daughter will decide which parent she wants to have, have her vote cast by. All right. Now, what's wrong with this? Well, some people have suggested that this cuts against a very important principle. One person, one vote. Many people, for whatever reason, don't have children. And parents don't always do things in the best interests of their kids. Parents won't necessarily cast that vote in, in the name of their children. They will just be getting two extra vote, uh, an extra vote. And this, in some sense, privileges some adults over others. That's a reasonable argument. After all, we know when we transfer money to parents, it's not always spent in the best interest of the child. Okay? But we do it anyways because it probably does more good than bad. All right. But there's a conversation to be had there. Unless, of course, you feel that children are not persons in the legal sense. Then you wouldn't buy into this idea at all. But if you accepted that, then why wouldn't you take the vote away from the elderly, who are also not any more capable? What else is wrong with this? I can just imagine staring down my dining room table and seeing the look on my 15-year-old's face when she learns that I get to cast her vote. The father who doesn't know how to choose clothing is going to cast, uh, cast her vote. So some children could write quite reasonably be against this, invoking the argument of citizenship as capability. Frankly, some 16-year-olds are more capable, more informed, and more responsible than many adults. But even more seriously, home is sometimes a dangerous place. Children can be abused, and some children will leave the home even before the age of majority. Should parents still be casting the vote in cases like that? This voting scheme is called demony voting. It's been in the conversation, sort of on the edges of it, for about 100 years. But more recently, a Hungarian-American demographer, Paul Demony, wrote about it in the 1980s. And it's given uh, that name in his honor. All right? It's not perfect, uh, but it is good and doable. And one wonders whether the, do, uh, the good and doable should fall victim to the perfect and unattainable. In 1918, the UK Parliament finally passed a, an act that gave everyone the right to vote. All men over the age of 21 had the right to vote. In fact, men who were 19, if they were in active service in World War I, could vote. And all women had the right to vote. If they were over the age of 30, and they were of property, theirs or their husbands. As momentous as this step was, it obviously, the logic fell under its own weight. And by 1928, a new act was passed. Another step was taken in which all citizens, regardless of class, regardless of gender, as long as they were over the age of 21, had the right to vote. This is a conversation democracies have had for a long time between citizenship as privilege and citizenship as a right. In the 1900s, that conversation was about increasing the franchise without regard to property and social status. In the 20th century, it was about increasing the franchise with, 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 without regard to gender. 
And perhaps in our time, it will be about increasing the franchise without regard to age. So I invite you into that conversation with wonder at how far it's developed and with a certain curiosity about how our words and our deeds will be interpreted by our grandchildren. Thank you.